All right. Thank you, Ashley. David G., alcoholic addict, and really, really, really glad to be here. Even more glad that you're here this week. Really glad that you're back from your trip. Glad that you're feeling better, and God is good. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for everybody that behind the scenes that put this meeting on. And thank you for allowing me to come out and share experience, strength, and hope with you through the big book and just kind of just that share experience, strength, and hope. I always like to say that I'm not the guru of the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. My take on it is my experience. I don't speak for any fellowship as a rule. I don't represent anyone but many. And my experience is my experience through the big book. And I'm grateful anytime that I'm asked to share that anytime. We've been studying through the big book for, I don't know how many weeks now, quite a few. And we started at the forwards and Went into the doctor's opinion, looked at the physical allergy. We looked at the obsession to the mind. We looked at Bill's story. We looked at his experience with the steps, how the message and the solution was brought to him. We seen that he did not like that solution. <laughs> we seen that he didn't like that solution very much at all. And if you remember, it was on page 12. He said, despite the living example of my friend talking about Evie, there remained to me the vestiges of my old prejudice, the word God still aroused a certain answer to be when the thought and i think that's the key word the thought was expressed that there might be a god personal me this feeling was intensified i didn't like that idea so people ask me all the time how do you know he didn't like the solution well it kind of tells me right there he didn't like the idea he said i could go for such conceptions creative intelligent universal mind spirit of nature but i resisted the thought of the czar of the heaven however loved me sway may be and so he knew in telling us about the spiritual experience, a lot of us wasn't going to take to that, probably because of some preconceived ideas that was brought to us growing up. I know that was the case for me, for sure. You know, I was raised in um, southeastern Oklahoma, and my family was of the Pentecostal faith, and that's a pretty wild bunch of uh, uh, characters. They really are. Today, I have respect for him, but at the time, I had none. And uh, the things that I've seen that connected to a spiritual experience, I absolutely want to know part of that. So I'm very grateful for the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm very grateful for these teachings because it tells me that although I can't accept those things, and I couldn't accept those things, that I can still have a spiritual experience and recover from the things that are killing me here. And we looked last week on page 25. We landed on page 25 where it says there is a solution. I'm pretty sure that we read that paragraph down to where it says the great fact. And we also looked at the spiritual experience in the back of the book. If you didn't get a chance to do that, I'd really uh, encourage you to listen to last week's tape and go back and take an in-depth look at the spiritual experience as we looked at it in the book. A lot of good stuff there. If I'm going to have a spiritual experience in order to recover, I definitely want to know what that looks like, according to these guys. And and that part of the back of the book is really sacred. So this week we're going to pick up where it says the great fact is just this and nothing less. We have had deep and effective spiritual experiences. And there's that asterisk again. And if you look at the bottom of the page, it'll say fully explained in appendix two. And again, we looked at that last week. But this is just a bird's eye view of what it looked like for me. I kept thinking a spiritual experience was there would be loud noises and flashing lights. And I had all these preconceived ideas of what a spiritual experience was going to look like. And I once heard a man say in Alcoholics Anonymous in the early days, if you can explain your spiritual experience, you probably haven't had one yet. Well, he was an old timer and I wasn't going to dispute what he had to say. But as I look back now, I, I think he's wrong about that. And the reason that I think that he's wrong is because of what we're about to read. They obviously explained theirs right here. And I know they had. one, So I, I don't believe that. Not everything I hear in the fellowship, I believe, if it doesn't line up with the book, and many years later, I see that that statement just does not line up with the book because it says the great fact is just this and nothing less. We've had deep and effective spiritual experiences. This is what it looks like. It revolutionized my whole attitude. That's something that definitely needed <laughs> revolutionized. That's something that definitely needed to change within me. It says toward life. Now, 
my outlook on life, you know, even though I thought it was good, I made a lot of money. I've done this. I've done that. It was not very good at all. I was hurting people. I was running myself to the ground and them. So this spiritual experience is going to revolutionize my attitude toward life, toward my fellows. Oh, my God. How huge is that? Without that, there is no spiritual experience for me. If for me, and it's going to talk about this later in the book on page 55, it's going to say that we're, we find the great reality deep within ourselves. And if that great reality is deep within me, then it's deep within you. And when I hold you at a distance, I hold that power at a distance. And when I let you in, I let that power in and we begin to heal together. That's why the step says we, not me or I. So revolutionize my whole attitude toward life, toward my fellows and toward God's universe. That's what a spiritual experience looks like for me. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty. In other words, I'm going to be absolutely certain about this. There's going to be no mistake. I'm not going to doubt it. I'm not going to question it. I'm not going to ask somebody else for their opinion about it. I am absolutely certain that my creator has entered into my heart. And if he enters there, I must open a door in order to let that happen. And one of the thing, ways that I'm going to do that is to stop playing God in my life and in your life and in everybody else's life. And I'm going to leave that door open for the creator to enter into my heart and lives. A lot of people think that that word says lives into our hearts and our lives. But it, that, that word doesn't say lives. It says lives. Our creator has entered into our heart and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. And every one of us sitting on here sober that have recovered and had a spiritual experience could absolutely uh, share experience after experience on that. It says he has a commenced to accomplish those things for us, which we could never do by ourselves. And if you remember on page 83, it asked us to do that each day to ask for the creator to show us the way of kindliness, tolerance, patience, and love. Those are things I can never do for myself. Those are things that has to be done by this power greater than self. And once that's entered into my heart, that lives within my life, that's the way I behave. I'm not hurting people anymore the way that I did. I'm not running over people and bullying people or shying and running away from people or hiding in a corner. I don't do those things anymore. That's something I could never do for myself. That's something that had to be done. So here's a question. If you are seriously alcoholic as we were, sexaholic, lustaholic, drug addict, whatever it may be, if you are as serious as we were, not as we are, but as we were, that's past tense. I'm not that way anymore. Well, we believe there's no middle of the road solution, but the problem is my ego keeps showing up and it tries to find a third option to move into a different solution. It says we were in a position where life was becoming po impossible. We, we it doesn't say we are in that position. Obviously, by this point of the book, we're not in that anymore. If we're going through this process with a with a sponsor. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. That's step one. Even inside the fellowship for me, I found myself in a place where life was becoming impossible and I couldn't get I couldn't get free of it. And have we passed into the region and notice the word region. If you look at the top of page 24 over to the left, right up towards the top. It talks about he passes into a state. A state in a region is something different. A region is much bigger. And so now it says if we pass into the region from which there is no return through human aid, if that's the case, the fellowship has brought me as far as it's going to be able to bring me. Thank God for the fellowship, and I love them. I love it with all my heart. I do. But if I'm relying upon that for permanent recovery, sobriety, and spiritual experience, I'm in big trouble. And I promise you, I had passed into the region which there was no return through human aid, meetings, fellowship. Everything that I'd tried to do had failed. It had utterly failed. It says we have two alternatives. One is to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could. That's step one. And the other, step two, is to accept spiritual help. There really is no other alternative. But my ego continues to try to find a third option and come back in and play God and to assist me with my spiritual experience. This is what is very strange about the ego, about the self. It will use spiritual principles to guide my life. I see that when I write inventory, because when I do the fifth step, I'm sitting right there talking about things that I've written down on paper. And I can absolutely see that was a lie. 
that's where my mind was tricking me. So without a guide, without somebody there to help me with this process, I could never see the truth the way that I've seen it now. Step one, the consciousness of our intolerable situation. Step two, accept spiritual help. It said this we did because we honestly wanted to and we were willing to make the effort. For me, that's a question. Am I really willing to make the effort to do this? I have people call me a lot of the times and they'll be really going through a bad time in their life and they'll be hurting. And, you know, I ask them, you know, are you willing to make the effort to go through the process? Well, I don't know. I need to pray about that. I need to sit with that. And it's like, you definitely do. You do. You don't need to talk to me. You need to do that. So this is a man by the name of Roland Hazard that we're going to read about. And he was one of the men that appeared in court to have Abby's sentence suspended back in Bill's story. Just his very name, Roland Hazard. I think most of us have been a rolling hazard in life or in the fellowship or somewhere. I know I have been for sure. But it says that a certain American businessman, he had ability, good sense, and high character. There's a lot of guys that I know like that in the fellowship. A lot of us. High character, good sense, ability. This man came from a very wealthy family. If you remember the Burlington Colt Factory or the Burlington Railroad or any of the things that was connected to the Burlingtons. That was this man. And his brother was a governor. His father was a mayor. And Roland, they had money. They had a lot of money. But Roland was a drunk. And uh, that's why it says, you know, he had ability, good sense, high character. For years, he floundered from one sanitarium to another. Think about that in our own life. If we were to put that in the first person right now, think about the places we floundered to trying to get help in our addiction. Meetings, therapy, for me, sweat lodges, churches. I mean, you name it. Uh, One sanitarium to another, that's kind of what most of us do before we really lock into this solution like he's going to. We have to get pretty beat up like he does here. It says he had consulted the best-known American psychiatrist and remembered, you know, to get from one continent to another, you had to take an ocean liner, and that's what he did. He went to Europe. It said then he had gone to Europe, placing himself under the care of the celebrated physician, the psychiatrist, Dr. Jung, who prescribed for him, though experience had made him skeptical. Roland finished his treatment with unusual confidence. He spent a year with Dr. Jung. He looked at three psychiatrists over there. I think one was Freud, one was Abner, and the other was Jung. The other two wasn't taking patients at the time he ended up with Carl Jung. And thank God he did. You know, my partner, Jim that I've done these studies with for a long, long time. When I do them with somebody, he always says we'd probably be sitting around talking about nothing but sex had it been Freud. So, you know, thank God he ended up with Dr. Carl Jung. So anyway, it says his physical and mental condition were unusually good. doesn't say anything about the spiritual here. And so that's something that I really try to pay attention to. Most of us come in, we sober up, we heal up, we heal up from lust or whatever do. Physically, we start feeling a little better. Mentally, we start doing pretty good. But we miss this part. We miss the spirituality. And I think that's what happens here. Because it says, above all, he believed. And I think this is the key word. Anytime I believe something, as much as he did right here, that is, that is a fact in my life. He believed that he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and his hidden spring that relapse was unthinkable. How could somebody like us and like him who have been through that over and over and over experience shows we're going to fall out with lust again and again and again, alcohol and drugs. We're going to fall out over and over and over. Why would it that my mind would believe that I have acquired such a profound knowledge by going to Alcoholics Anonymous or Sexholics Anonymous or wherever I go? That relapse is unthinkable for me, although I felt that very way, and I'm sure many of you have too. But nevertheless, he's drunk in a short time, more baffling. He, still, he could give himself no satisfactory explanation for his fall. So he returned to this doctor, Dr. Young. The story is, you know, he spent a year over there. He, he got on the boat to come home. He made it to France. He got drunk. His mind told him, hey, one drink ought to be good. He took a drink, triggered the allergy, although he didn't know about the allergy. See, Dr. Silkworth was the one who knew about the allergy all the way across in New York. Dr. Jung knew about the spiritual experience, the mental condition. It was only whenever Ebby Bill 
Roland Hazard, Seeper Grace, all these guys that God put all these men together, that this really became a reality. And so here's why I think that Roland could not and did not recover at this particular point. This next sentence says it all. He wished above all things to regain self-control. So small s. If I could tell you any one thing here tonight, probably you already know. If that's what you're here seeking, <laughs> chances are you're a long way from being ready to recover from a hopeless state of mind and a key. If you're here above all things to regain self-control, best of luck with that. Let me know how that works out for you. It says he seemed quite rational and well-balanced with respect to other problems, as most of us do. Yet he had no control, whatever, whenever it came to alcohol. Why was this? Well, he begged the doctor to tell him the whole truth, and he got it in the doctor's judgment. He was utterly hopeless. That's step one in its entirety. He could never again regain his position in society, and he'd have to place himself under lock and key and hire a bodyguard if he expected to live long. That was the great physician's opinion. We know today that's not the truth, thank God. But look how cool this is after the spiritual experience. This man still lives, and he's a free man. My God. In 24 years in Alcoholics Anonymous, I finally got to walk a free man. I'd been free of alcohol and drugs for a long time. Lust had been killing me. For sure it had, as it does many of us. But I can tell you that stuff has nothing to do with walking a free man here. It's getting rid of old ideas, beliefs, concepts, prejudices, attitudes, all these conceptions. That's what we're really here to heal from is that stuff. And once we heal from that, we walk a free man. No matter what the flea might have been, the bug is now being treated and things are good. It says he does not need a bodyguard, nor is he confined. Why would he? He can go anywhere on this earth that other free men go without disaster. What a promise. But there is a condition. And here it is. Provided. <laughs> Key word. Provided. He remains willing to maintain a certain simple attitude. And that simple attitude is one of abandonment to God. It's one of continuing to walk through this process, do these steps, continue in our amends, live in steps 10, 11, and 12, the best of our ability. Some of our alcoholic readers may think, I think that's a dangerous statement. Yeah, most of us may think that we can do it without spiritual help. Why would we think something like that? When experience after experience shows me that's not the case. Well, I think that's the self that we're going to really be digging into as we move on through the rest of these chapters. Let's tell you the rest of the conversation our friend Roland had with his doctor young. The doctor said, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. I have never seen one single case recover where that state of mind existed to the extent that it does in you. The man that did my fifth step with me and taking me through this process told me the exact same thing. He said, I've seen a lot of guys in recovery but I've never seen one where lust and acting out dominates a man's life the way that it does yours. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and I, I felt as though the same way Roland felt right here. Our friend felt as though the gates of hell had closed with him in a clang. And I just often think of that clang. I've been locked up, been locked up for a long time before. And when you hear that iron door shut behind you, there ain't nobody coming to get you where I was. You're there. And you're going to join in and you're going to become a part of or you're going to become a part from. And you better pray to God you become a part of. Because if you don't, <laughs> it's not a very good. There's going to be some clanging going on. And, and it's, it's not pretty. So he said to the doctor the same thing I said to the man in different terms. Is there no exception? And yes, replied the doctor, there are exceptions to cases such as yours, which has been occurring since early times here and there. Once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called vital spiritual experiences. Look at what Young says. He says, to me, these occurrences are phenomenal. My, my big book sponsor guide had me to write above that word, even in AA, even in SA. Those occurrences seem phenomenal because very few have them. A lot are sober on the fellowship. They seem to be doing good. But there's some of us that show up to those meetings every day and act out every day when we leave those meetings. You know what I'm saying? So. We took a bird's eye view of what that spiritual experience looked like back there on page 25. Let's take a little deeper look at what it looks like right here. What the doctor is going to give this beautiful description of what that looks like. 
they appear to be in the nature of a huge emotional displacement and rearrangement. And that's what I need in my life right there. Just to be free of lust and alcohol and drugs, that's a wonderful thing. Don't get me wrong. God, that's beautiful. Wife's happy. I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not shooting pistols and raising hell anymore. The sheriff's happy. Dogs, everybody's happy except me. I'm very unhappy. But when I have one of these, it's in the nature of something much different. It's a huge emotional displacement and rearrangement of everything, of my beliefs, my concepts, my ideas, the things that are killing me. And this is what he says, ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which were once the guiding force of the lives of these men, are suddenly cast to one side. Suddenly, not in a little while. When this experience happens, it comes on me like that, and it's there. And I like to take that word guiding forces, those two words, and I like to turn them around. I like to put forces first and guiding next. And really, this is what's going on on the inside of me. I have a force that is guiding me through my ideas, through my emotions, through my attitudes. And this is what's keeping me in bondage to self. And I cannot recover no matter how many times I get sober, I always fall back out and relapse. And I can't understand why. But there's something guiding me. And he's saying, these are the things that are going to be cast out of me. My experience in, in, a, in a hotel room in Shreveport, Louisiana, after doing one of these big book studies with another man at a huge convention, laying in a bed and was fully disclosed and had to get honest for the most part. I remember something turning loose in me. It was almost like a fever broke. And it was just like I, the whole bed was soaked with sweat where something inside of me had finally turned loose. And it's, it was something in the nature of it that, that was a force that was guiding me and that had a grip on me for so many years. And when that turned loose, I can remember just thinking, I'm going to be okay. But what I didn't know, I was going to have to walk through a whole lot of hell and a whole lot of making it right with people before I would be okay. And so that's what we see here. These are suddenly cast to one side. Now, you and I get to have the same experience. We get to have the same experience if we go through this process of the book. Because if you will just hold your place and flip to page 72 for just a quick second. And this is talking about the fifth step after we went through that long journey of inventory. And there's a few of them on here can tell you about that long journey for sure. It says, having made our personal inventory, what shall we do about it? We've been trying to get a new attitude and relationship. See, over here it says those are the things that are going to be cast out, right? And discover the obstacles in our path. What are they? It's those things that that force is guiding us with. We've admitted certain defects in the fourth column. We've ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We've put our finger on the weak items in our personal inventory. Now these are about to be cast out. So you and I. If we go through this process, as outlined in the book, get the very same experience that he's describing to Roland right here. He says, suddenly, these are cast to one side and a completely new set of conceptions. See, not a new flea. I mean, the, the bug is what's been healed. We walk in a free man from self now. A completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. Completely new. Those ideas, they're not there anymore. I don't know what happened. I often say I don't care what happened, but I do know that they were replaced by a new set. And man, thank God for that, because this is where we recover right here. You want to know how to get sober? Don't drink. You want to know how to not act out anymore? Don't act out. But I promise you, and the old saying in AA is you can sober up a horse thief, but you still got a horse thief. Here we get to recover as a horse thief. So the doctor says, in fact, I've been trying to produce some such emotional rearrangement, key words right there, within you. Nobody can do that for us. That's why Dr. Jung couldn't do that for him. We're beyond human aid. If a human can do that for me, I promise you, I would have recovered a long time ago. I've had preachers pray over me. Therapists prescribe things for me. I've had Indian medicine men give me things. I'm beyond human aid. Nobody can produce this within me. Nothing. It comes from within me, but nobody can produce that within me. So he says with many individuals, the method I've employed are successful. And I think some people that don't have the bug as bad as, as we do, especially with our addiction. He says that some of these are, have been successful, but I've never been successful with an alcoholic of your description. That's hopelessness, man. That's hopelessness. 
Well, upon hearing this, our friend Roland was somewhat relieved for he reflected after all, he's a good church member. My sponsor had me to write AA member up above that, SA member, whatever your fellowship may be here tonight. Pay real close attention to this because I had to. This hope, however, was destroyed by the doctor telling him while his religious convictions were very good, while our fellowship convictions are very good, in our case, they don't spell the vital necessary spiritual experience. Oh, my God. How crazy is that? Just go to meetings and don't drink. You ever hear that? Just go to meetings. Don't act out. Good luck with that. If that works for you, I think that's wonderful. But the problem is I don't have enough power to do that. I go to meetings and act out. I go to meetings and drink. With all my heart not wanting to drink, and I go back and drink. Promising God, my wife, and everybody else that I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do those things. I'm not going to shoot at nobody. I ain't going to hurt nobody no more. And I go do those things. And I think, my God. And then my mind tells me, you're such a terrible person. It's almost like my mind sets me up to do that, and then it beats me up for doing that. And this is just an inner cycle. It never quits. And this was the terrible dilemma, top of page 28, that our friend, that terrible dilemma is step one, by the way, found himself. This is where Roland was when he had that extraordinary experience, which we have already told you, made him a free man. See, just because he quit drinking again, he quit acting out, whatever the issue was, that's not what made him a free man. What made him a free man was he had the spiritual experience, the vital spiritual experience necessary to recover from a hopeless state of mind and body. That's what made him a free man. It is a terrible dilemma. The one thing I know about spiritual experience, it all has the same thing in common as suffering. When I suffer enough, and I did, I thought many times, but when I finally hit the bottom of my rope with that, and many people on here can understand this tonight, I promise you there was an experience that came to me that I wasn't even looking for. I wasn't trying to manage it. I wasn't trying to control it. In fact, I said, I don't care what happens. If I go back to prison, I go back to prison. If my wife leaves, she leaves. I don't care what happens. I need to do whatever I need to do to recover, whether she's coming home or leaving home. It don't matter. I got, to, I got to recover. And I think at that point is when the experience happened for me at a much deeper level. Although I didn't realize how much of an impact it would have at the time that was shortly revealed. So he says, we in our turn sought the same escape with the desperation of drowning men. I got sober August 8th, 1994 in Alcoholics Anonymous from alcohol and a life of drugs and violence and crime and all this stuff. And I'd been to AA many times to try to recover and get sober. But for some reason, this time I did. I went back to my people, Native Americans, and they took me in and took me under their wing and began to walk to with me in the Native way couple. But there was one man there that was Alcoholics Anonymous, and he knew the book, and he knew the steps, and he was very savvy, and he had wisdom. And he had recovery, and I mean, he just a, it was just a great experience for me in my life. And things began to change. I really started to recover from a lot of old ideas. I didn't believe some of the things I'd been taught as a kid about God. I, was, I, I got to where I wasn't scared of him anymore. They showed me a way to do different ceremonies and begin to heal in those areas of my life. I lost my children, you know, as most of us do, a couple of years before that. And while I was there, they encouraged me to write a letter like our book says to do. And I wrote a letter to my ex-wife explaining where I was at and what was going on in my life. And uh, she had agreed to let me see my sons. And it was just a great time. A lot of things were healing. So she said, well, you know, the summer will come around here pretty soon. And what I'll do, I'll just bring them out. And she said, you know, I trust that you'll take care of them, you know. And God, for her to even say those words had to come from a <laughs> power greater than herself because they had moved almost five states away to get away from me and my insanity and my disease. So about one week, I uh, mean, I just built up to this a wonderful time, you know, going to Alcoholics Anonymous, feeling free, having a good time. And about one week before they were to come out, Memorial Day weekend, 1995, the youngest one drowns at Lake Monroe, Indiana, at a Memorial Day event. They have a guy, there's a couple of them, her husband now has one of my sons on his shoulder and his friend has the other and they're out playing around in the water and they see a nearby picnic table and they think well we'll wait over and you know it was just a freak thing a lot of flooding up there that time of year undercurrent caught him took the little one under and he drowned 
Well, the guy that had him on his shoulders kept going under, kept going under, trying to save him, trying to save him, and he drowned as well, trying to save him. So anytime I read this, I, I think of what the way that they must have fought for their life that day, especially the older man, because I'm sure he was fighting for his life to try to save his. When I work with a new man, if I don't see this in him, chances are I'm going to try to get him the help he needs with somebody else, but I'm probably not going to sponsor that man because otherwise if we don't have the desperation of a drowning man, I'm not going to fight for recovery. I'm not going to fight for life and I don't really care about anybody else. I'm just out for me. So unless I've sought in my turn, sought the same escape with the desperation of drowning men, chances for me is I'm just, I'm still not finished. And that's just my experience. That's not, I'm not saying that's how it is for everybody, but it says what at first seemed a flimsy read and trust me, it did has proved to be the loving and powerful hand of God. My God, that's so true for all of us. The loving and powerful hand. That was much different than the conception of God I grew up with. He was very unloving. He was very cruel to those who wasn't just. And hell, I just couldn't be just. And so, yeah. A new life has been given us. What a promise right there. My God, look at that promise in the book. Or if you prefer a design for living that really works. This distinguished American psychologist, William James, in his book, Variety of Religious Experience, indicates a multitude of ways in which men have discovered God. Thank God for that sentence right there when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. The way I was told, there's only one way to God, and that's the way you better find it. And if you don't find that way, that's your butt. I mean, that's, that's the end of you. Where I come from here in the South, they will burn you to the stake for even talking about a different kind of conception of God. Here's what I've learned in my own experience. There's only one God, one creator, but there's many conceptions of that creator. Find one that fits. That's what I did for sure. So we have no desire to convince anyone that there's only one way by which faith may be acquired. Now, there are certain churches that I've attended would absolutely burn this book completely <laughs> to ashes over that sentence right there because that is their experience, and I respect that today, but I don't agree with it in my life for sure. If what we have learned, felt, and seen, see, that's what step two is to me right there. It means anything at all. It means all of us, not a few of us, or not just a few that accept this or this. All of us, no matter what our race, creed, or color, this is open to all men, our book says, and I know it to be the truth today. I sponsor Muslims, I sponsor Jews, I sponsor Buddhists, I sponsor atheists, I sponsor Christians. I'm a part of all of that, but I'm none of any of it. And that's been my experience today. I love it. When I sponsor a man, there's a lot of things that I can learn from a man in a different faith. I want to talk to him about his faith. I want to know what he believes. I want to see if that works for me. If it does, great. I'm going to hold on to it. If it don't, you can bet I'm going to get rid of it. It doesn't matter what him or anyone else thinks. But I love this. Doesn't matter whatever our race, creed, or color, we are all the children of a living creator with whom we may form a relationship upon simple and understandable terms. It was always hard for me to even think about that. The book says, no, it's pretty simple and understandable. The ego is what makes it hard, the self. But it does say there is a condition, and here it is. As soon as we're willing and honest enough to try, there it is again. We've seen that just a couple of pages ago it keeps coming back to that those of us having religious affiliations will find nothing here disturbing disturbing to their belief or ceremonies there is no friction among us over such matters i don't know that to be the case a lot of fellowships i go to seem to have some friction over that i try to stay out of that business it's no concern of mine it really isn't i don't really care about any of that I just know that there is a path through this book that will take you to healing and recovery if you're willing and honest enough to do it. So he says, we think it no concern of ours what religious bodies our members identify with themselves as individuals. This should be an entirely personal affair. And I think that's where a lot of, at least where I live, a lot of the churches have got off of course with that. It's really not a personal affair. It's something between them, me, and God. And, you know, I don't think it's a, a three-way deal. I think, and even me as a sponsor, taking somebody through this work is outlined in this book. I let them know when you send your nightly review, I'm just the guy reading it. 
this is your letter to God at the end of the day. When I said in a fifth step, I'm just the man hearing it. This is between you and the creator as, you know, <laughs> I'm just the vessel here. And he says it right here. This should be an entirely personal affair, which each one decides for himself. And I know he's talking about religion here. He says in the light of past associations or his present choice. I mean, if my sponsor told me this and thank God for it, he said, David, you add any of that to the big book and your recovery that you want, uh, your Christian faith, your, your Buddhist faith, whatever it is, add anything you want. Just don't take this away and put that in its place. Because if you do, you're headed for big trouble. And my experience absolutely shows that that's the truth. So in my 11th step, there's a lot of things that I add to it. But the one thing I don't take away from it is pages 86 through 88. And I'm just not going to do that. Not all of us join religious bodies, but most of us favor such memberships. A lot of people do, and I think that's great. In the following chapter, there appears to be an explanation of alcoholism as we understand it. And that's step one. In a chapter addressed to the agnostic, that's going to be step two. That entire chapter is going to be on step two. Many who were once in this class are now among our members. Surprisingly enough, we find such convictions no obstacle to a spiritual experience. Thank God. Further on, clear-cut directions are given showing how we had recovered. I think, you know, any meeting could read that one sentence right there and talk about it for days. Because further on in this book, I mean, when I read this, and I'd read it many times, but when I really read this, it's telling me right there, this book is going to give me clear-cut directions on how to recover. It's not going to tell me. It's going to show me. And it says it. Clear-cut directions are given, showing, not telling, how we have recovered. That's the first 100 people that was a part of writing the book. These are followed by 42 personal experiences. Each individual in the person's personal story describes in his own language and from his own point of view the way he established his relationship with God, not mine, his. These give a fair cross-section of our membership and a clear-cut idea of what actually happened in their life. And one of the things I do with the people that I work with is I have them take a look at this real closely. What actually did happen in your life? Take away the drugs, take away the alcohol, take away the sex, take away all that stuff. And ask yourself this question right here. What actually happened in my life? And if you can't answer that question, you're definitely in the right spot at this part of the book because the book's going to reveal it very quickly. And it says here, we hope that no one will consider these self-revealing accounts, small s. That's what's going to be revealed here. Moving through the rest of this process, we're going to reveal self and take a look at it for exactly what it is. Some of it's ugly. <laughs> and some of it hurts. It does. But if it did, I couldn't have healed. So it says, we hope no one will consider these self-revealing accounts in bad taste. Most, most will. Our hope is that many alcoholic men and women desperately in need, step one. We'll see these pages, keywords right there, these pages. I mean, that kept getting drilled into me over and over and over and over. These pages, David, these pages, these pages. Fellowship's wonderful. You got to have it, but the program is in the book. It's in the book. It's in these pages. It's in these, and they just kept drilling that into me, and they would just not get up off of it because the book does. It says we believe it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems, not to the public, not to the world, but to someone one on one, so I can allow this power to come in. That I'll be persuaded to say yes, I'm one of them too. I must, I must have this thing. So my sponsor asked me this question, power, choice, and control, because we're going to be looking at a lot of that coming up in the next chapter as well. If you've lost any one of these, did you ever really have it to begin with? And that's something he just always asked me over and over. So when I look at the word power, the definition of that is possessing energy or great force or having authority. That's what power is. Choice is to select or to choose or to regulate or, or whatever. Have I done that with my illness? Have I done that with my addiction? And if I have, how's that worked out for me? And anytime I get away from that, have I tried to come back to that? And why? Why would I come back to that? Control. Have an authority to regulate, direct, or dominate a situation. That's what control is. If I lose any one of these, did I have it to begin with? 
will, a choice or determination of one having authority, control, or power. Mental power is manifested as wishing, choosing, designing, intensity. The will of power is making a reasoned choice or a power of controlling one on his or her actions. That's what the will is. That's what has controlled me all this time. I didn't know that, I, that it was alcohol. I thought it was drugs. I thought it was sex. You hear it all the time. Just go to meetings, don't drink. Just go to meetings, don't act out. If you can do that, wonderful. That's, that's cool. You may still have some power, choice, and control. But I know for this alcoholic addict, I tried every bit of that over and over and over and over, and it, it just didn't work. So this is a great chapter. There is a solution here, and it's not quitting drinking, and it's not quitting acting out. It's this vital spiritual experience as the result of these steps. The miracle is that I haven't drank or drugged or acted out today. The miracle is I haven't even wanted to today. Never crossed my mind one time. Wow. It used to stay in my head every day, all day. What a miracle. It doesn't say this is the solution. It says there is a solution. And for guys like you and me, gals, this is it. The vital spiritual experience necessary to recover. It's very simple. It's not hard. Very simple. So if you haven't been through this process as outlined in the book, I encourage you to do so. There's women on here that absolutely able to take you through that process. Men as well. It's a great thing. Uh, thank God I didn't miss it. Thank God. So I'm going to close off right there. And I'd love to hear other people's experience with this or any questions you may have. Uh, I'll try to answer them. You know, I'm there again. I'm not the guru. I don't know it all. But uh, I guarantee you there's people on here that do. So. Anyway, Ashley, thank you for your service. Dennis, you as well, brother. And uh, love you guys. Thanks a lot. This concludes David's share on tonight's chapter, but we encourage you to keep listening as he answers questions from the audience and shares additional experience, strength, and hope. Good to see you. Thank you, David. Another wonderful, wonderful evening here. I'm always so grateful that I've been invited to these, you know, really. But uh, my question has to do with just if you, on page 28, we, we in our turn sought the same escape with all the desperation of drowning men. And I know that when I came on in and started working these steps, that was what was going on. I knew that I was dying. And uh, I find it hard to gauge when I'm talking with someone if they have that. I mean, they'll say, yeah, I've got that. Yeah, yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they really are in that place. Have you had any, is this just a thing of opening your intuition or is it a matter of you've been listening to them all along to see where they're actually at or anything you can suggest to ferret that out would be helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. And it's good to see you, brother, as always. I really kind of listen whenever I'm talking to someone, as, as a lot of you know, there is an interview process to working with a new guy on page 90 of this book. And I didn't know it for a long time. I just say, sure, let's just go work the steps, you know. But there's an entire paragraph there that asks certain questions, you know, of, of the man that you're talking to. And one of the things that I try to listen for is um, they would say things along the line like, you know, I, I'm, I'm just dying from this stuff. I'm willing to do anything that I have to do to get better, to become a better father, to be a better husband, to be a better son. You know, those are wonderful things. I'm not saying they're not. But really, whenever I'm looking at abandonment to God, I don't even think that that's really not even a part of anything. So really, that kind of tells me I listen for stuff like that. So I know that although it may be for him, there's, there's other things there that it, it's going to block him from that. So I try to read into that same way with prayer. God help me be a better husband. Help me be a better man. Help me to be a better employee. Help me to do the help me, help me, help me, help me. The damn prayer turns into me. And I don't even know that's happening. But the more that I listen to stuff like that, I, you know, I ask him, did you pray? Yes, I asked God to help you do this and help me and help me and help me. And so, you know, I, I can point that out. But at the same time, really, the desperation of a drowning man is one is I don't give a damn what we got to do. Let's just do it right now. If she leaves, um, you know, obviously we don't want that to happen. But 
I don't know. That's kind of my experience with what that's talking about there. I know for me, at the end of it, it didn't matter what happened. I, I knew I was probably going to lose everything that I'd ever worked for here. I just knew it was all gone. And at that point, I didn't even care. I just knew I needed to get better. And I think until I hear that coming back from somebody's mouth, it's really, I mean, I mean, we can go chase the steps and it's going to help me stay sober and this and that, but I'm, I'm really more interested in helping a man have a spiritual experience than anything else. So anyway, thanks for your question, brother. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, I got two things and David, thank you. Cause that's exactly one of the two things I'm going to share here is working with you. I, I did have that spiritual experience and I love that the more of a spiritual experience that I have, the more I can see it in this reading. I've read through this many times, but like here on page 27, it says that what he had was called a vital spiritual experiences. And to these occurrences are phenomena. They appear to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements, ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which were once guiding forces of the lives of these men are suddenly cast aside. And when I saw, as we went through that fifth step was that, I cannot believe that the narrative, the stories, the lies that were being told me by this self's will, I could just see it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have hurt so many people and that's just not true. And so that awakening was the fact that just how insidious and deceptive that that self's will has been operating in kind of the background of my life so that it can stay and maintain control. And how beautiful that is to finally be free of that and to step into that sunlight of the spirit where I'm no longer doing anything like it says on page 84. But it says that that I'm no longer fighting anything or anyone. We're back on page 60. It says that I was in constant collision with something or somebody because in, the sanity has been restored. And when that sanity gets restored, that's the effect of connecting to the sunlight of the spirit. It's not me doing anything. And I am placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. The last thing I'll say is we're so lucky that Dr. Freud and Adler were busy because the only thing they would have helped Roland Hazard with was the inner workings of his mind. And just like Dr. Silkworth, Dr. Jung had seen these spiritual experiences. And it's not something that a doctor back in those days would probably be, you know, touting too much. He goes to Dr. Jung because he's available and he works, and he believed with everything that he had worked with Dr. Jung, that he had a year with him, that the inner workings of his mind, drinking would be impossible, but yet he got drunk again. So he goes back, and that's where Dr. Jung says, well, I've seen these vital spiritual experiences. And the last thing that we're so lucky that he went back, that he did, was able to hook up with the Oxford group, because back on page nine, Abby Thatcher, as he sat in the kitchen with Bill W., he said he did no ranting on bottom of nine. And a matter of fact, he told how two men had appeared in court persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. One of those was Roland Hazard. Roland came back, helped Abby. Abby got clean, went back and helped Bill. And we wouldn't be here without that. And that's all because two doctors were willing to bring something other than their medicine out. And that was that uh, vital spiritual experience that they'd seen. And they told about it. They didn't know how to get it, but they knew that there were people that could help them get that. And that's why I'm so thankful for guys like you. They're showing up doing this and helping me have that experience. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you, brother. And it's often been said that doctor could have very well have said, you know, your volume deficiency is a little bit low. Maybe you already increased your dosage on this, this, this. He done none of that. He stepped outside of what he knew as a physician and said, to me, these occurrences are phenomenon, but this is what they appear to look like. And that's for a physician to do that anytime. <laughs> so we see the hand of God here, no doubt. Thanks, Dennis. Love you, man. Love you too, David. So, David G., thank you for this uh, workshop. I, I appreciate it greatly. So my question is, uh, the American psychologist William James in his book, Varieties of Religious Experience, you know, in trying to do some of my own research, um, I am really confused in whether or not I should even go there and try to research and, and, and order the book. Then I go to Amazon. I see it's published in 1902, but there's so many selections. 
And, you know, I am in the midst of a spiritual awakening uh, myself, and it's gradual. I'm not seeing any bright lights. You know, I, I don't expect that. However, I am so curious. And in my recovery, I'm learning, you know, to not pay much so much attention on the educational side of it and just focus on the spirituality, uh, which is where I feel things. Uh, so I guess my question to you is, if there is a book out there, <laughs> and there are many, the varieties of the religious experience, which one should I get? Thank you. The only, the only one that I had ever, ever had and read was, was it was just called that, var variety of religious experiences. I didn't know that there were others or there were different volumes of it. One of the things that I really try to do is to lean into my spirit, whichever way it's, it's calling me. And for me, that has been the best course of action to take. If I read something, I'm drawn to that, read something else, but I'm drawn back to that. I kind of pay attention to that intuitively now. So I, that's what I would, I would suggest to do. I know for me, and until I had this experience that we're talking about here tonight that Dennis described that so many of, of other people on here have had, Ashley, Jason, so many. Those books were good reading material, but they really didn't hold the depth and weight that they do today, you know, after this experience has happened. So I'm, I'm really grateful. But that's if I was you, that would be what I would do. I would just kind of lean into which way I'm being pulled. And, uh, okay. Thank you. So, thank you. So glad you're here. <laughs>